Perfect. Hello and good morning, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar, GDPR Three Months On, where we'll discuss what's new in GDPR and how it'll affect your business. Um, I think Rachel has already um, done a quick sound check, so we'll get going. Um, hopefully, you'll find it useful. I was talking to somebody earlier today, so they were still struggling with knowing how to spell GDPR. Hopefully, you're not with them. <laughs> um, where others, we have, um, we have our guest speaker here today from the Data Protection Commissioner, and he's certainly telling us that there's an increase in workload there, so some people are, are uh, ahead of it. But uh, we'll get going um, anyway. Um, just a few housekeeping issues before we start today's CPD webinar. Or sorry, today we are CPD accredited, um, and you can benefit from 1.5 1.5 CPD points. Um, and if you'd like a cert, please fill in the survey at the end of the, the webinar. At the end of the webinar, we will have a Q and A session. And um, please type in your questions as you think of them. Um, if you've been on our webinars before, you'll know that the Q and A session we we always get a lot from it, and it's really informative section. As always, today's webinar is being recorded um, and we will automatically send you a copy of the recording along with the slides and a follow-up email. Um, and then finally, just there will be a short survey when you close down from the webinar today um, and we love to get your feedback and hear what you thought. Um, so please, please, if you could take a minute to fill it out for us, we'd really appreciate that as well. Okay, um, so today, Presenting, I'm Laura Murphy. I'm the HR manager here with Source Software, um, and we're delighted to welcome our guest speaker, um, Graham Doyle, who's head of communications with the Data Protection Commission Office. Um, Graham was appointed with the head of communications um, in 2017, if I right. um, And Graham has a responsibility for the management of the DPC's communication strategies, which includes extensive national and international media engagement, attending and speaking at events domestically and abroad, and delivering a comprehensive internal communications program as well. So we're very delighted, we're delighted to have Graeme here, and thank you very much for coming out thank today, Graeme. Also joining me is my, my colleague, Jenny Hussey, who you, a lot of you will be familiar with. Um, she's one of our more, most experienced staff on our phone supports. Um, and also Rachel Hines, who's from our marketing team, and she's been very modest and has put her, left herself out of the photographs this morning. <laughs> um, but we have a busy agenda this morning, as you can see here, so we really just need to get going, and hopefully um, we, we'll, we'll take maybe an hour or so with the with the webinar itself, and then we'll answer as many questions as we can, we, um, but hopefully we can get to as many. We'll probably cut off questions. Um, We'll see how, how we get on time-wise later on. And um, so I suppose without further ado, I'm going to pass you over now to Graham, um, and he's going to demystify the whole GDPR uh, realm for you. Thank you very much. Over to you, Graham. Thanks, Laura. And good morning, everybody. Um, demystifying the general data protection regulation in less than an hour is uh, going to be quite a challenge, <laughs> because I'm sure those of you who are, who are working with, been working with it for the last number of months and, and longer, and um, realise how much there is in the in the whole sphere of data protection. I know some of you may have um, already been taking part in some of these webinars where you've spoken spoken about the GDPR, but I am going to take it at a very high level and um, again, so it might be a bit of a refresher for people and also for those of you who haven't, um, just to an introduction, I suppose, to it. Um, so if we just kind of start straight away and say the focus of the focus of the GDPR and what it does, so the whole purpose of the GDPR was an introduction, it, it was a harmonization of what were data protection laws right across the EU and to try and bring a consistent way of, of processing. And it gives data subjects themselves more control of the data that we as organizations um, hold on them. It makes data controllers and processors more accountable. It makes personal data processing more transparent and that's really, really important and something that I'll be touching on during the course of, of the presentation. It, it also reduces the personal data security vulnerabilities that, that organizations have, and we'll be talking about breach notifications and things like that. And the final piece then is this whole idea of cooperation between supervisory authorities on cross-border processing. So what that actually means is that there are uh, 28 different DPAs, so data protection authorities across the EU, and the whole spirit of the GDPR, the whole thinking behind the GDPR is that there will be a lot more cooperation amongst the various different member state authorities and in dealing with complaints, breach notifications, investigations, and so on. But if we just start then, with, with, I suppose, with what's largely unchanged in the GDPR. So some the things that have been there um, for, for years now, for a number of years now, first was the concept of personal data, second is the active processing, 
toured what those principles of data protection are and then the definitions of what a controller and a processor are. So to go with the first one, people quite often ask me, well, when you talk about personal data, what are you actually talking about? So personal data is any information relating to an identified or identifiable natural person. So it's any living person where there's information there, and this can range from your name, address, date of birth, to your PPS number, across to IP addresses and so forth. So there's quite, it's quite broad, also includes photographs, videos that include individuals and so forth. The definitions then of processing, so what is processing of data? When we talk about, we, we regulate how data, personal data is processed, but what do we mean? And you can see here from, from the slide, it's pretty much everything from cradle to grave. It's from the collection of data, what you do with it in terms of how you organize it, how you store it, uh, how you disclose it, um, how you see there's one underlined there which is restricting data. That's a new thing under GDPR. So if you're going to restrict data, and um, you are actually processing, even though you're not doing anything with the data, it is a form of processing. If you're going to erase the data for any, for any reason, um, or destroy the data. So they're all different ways of explaining what the, defini what the definition of processing is. But I suppose the important thing for it is that it's pretty much anything you're doing with the data from cradle to grave of receipt of data to the time that you either destroy it or, or you move it on um, to another organization. I'll, I'll be touching on that now shortly. So the principles of data protection, I'm, I'm, I'm going to fly through these kind of things because it's just to give you give you kind of an idea. So it's you must obtain and process the information fairly. You keep it for one or more specified, explicit and lawful purposes. And that's really important that if you have data and you're retaining data, you must have a reason for why you're doing it. Um, and I'm sure there may be questions later on in relation to the whole idea of data retention. How long can you retain data for? The key thing here is it's up to yourself, but you need to have a lawful basis for why you retain data. You can use and disclose it only in ways that are compatible with the purposes. You must keep it safe and secure. I know it's a no-brainer, but that is a really, really important thing, that you must make sure that you have mechanisms in place, whether it's password encryption, whether you know whatever security methods you, you need to have. And in particular, for, for many, many of you guys out there, because you're talking about HR data, so you, you will hold very personal data. So it's very, very important that you have it in, in a safe and secure way. You must keep it accurate, complete, and up to date. Um, and I'll be touching on what the GDPR says on this because the GDPR enhances um, individuals' rights in this regard. You must ensure that it's adequate, relevant, and not excessive. So again, um, to give an example, a colleague of mine recently was, was explaining when she went online to do some shopping um, and she was buying herself a jumper, I think she said, and all of a sudden start asking her questions about the last book that she read and other other questions that may be used for other marketing purposes, you know, but again, is that excessive? Do you need to be holding on to that kind of information? And um, you retain it for no longer than is necessary and for the purpose or purposes, again, the data retention element. And then you must give a copy um, of personal data to an individual on request. And again, I'm going to talk about that shortly because those rights have been enhanced and further enhanced under the GDPR. So I suppose the definition of a data controller, because sometimes there's a little bit of confusion here between who's a data controller, who's a data processor, and what does it mean? So a data controller, the, the definition in the legislation is it's the natural or legal person, public authority, agent, or other body, which alone or jointly with others determines the purpose and means of processing of personal data. So I suppose in, in circumstances where you are a HR, you are processing HR data um, for your, your employees, well, in those circumstances where you are processing that data, you are the controller of the data. You are the data controller. The second one then is in relation to a processor. So again, it's the same. It's a natural legal person, public authority agency or anybody which processes personal data on behalf of the controller. So again, following on from the example with yourselves, it may be that you um, outsource an element of your your um, management, your HR management, maybe your payroll is outsourced. In those circumstances, you are the data controller um, and the outsource, whether it's a bureau and that outsourced company or organization, they are the actual processor for you, but you are the data controller. So <clears throat> what's new in the GDPR? Um, the top two here are probably the real, real, um, the biggies. And for ourselves as an organization, there's certainly the areas that we are looking at um, from day one in terms of accountability and transparency. 
I'm going to be going through them all now, now shortly. The third one is uh, what's known as a risk-based mandatory data breach uh, reporting mechanism. Then there's strengthen, strengthened um, consent obligations. I've touched on the new and enhanced data subject rights, um, which I'll go through shortly. There are the introduction for the first time here in Ireland of administrative fines. And then there's a thing known as a data protection officer. So this is for certain organizations. And again, I'm going to go through all of these in detail now. So the first is accountability. So again, I'm not going to spend too much time going through the actual legislation and what it's saying, albeit it's there for you to see. So it's, it's a controller shall implement appropriate technical and organizational measures to ensure you're able to demonstrate that processing is performed in accordance with the GDPR and also adherence to approved codes of conduct within various industries where standards will be set and codes, codes of conduct will, will be approved. Um, they may be used as, as an element by which to demonstrate that you're compliant with the obligations of the controller. So that's just, the, I suppose, the, the technical and the legal bit done. But I suppose the, the piece I think that's probably more beneficial is this. So to demonstrate practically how, as an organization, you can show accountability. So we would say maintaining up-to-date inventories of processing. So it's in, it's again, the articles that are referred to here are all articles that are in the GDPR. Second thing is that you complete data protection impact assessments. So again, for some of you guys out there, we may have, I'm sure we have some bigger, bigger organizations and we may have some smaller SMEs who are very worried about, you know, the implications of the GDPR, but your starting point really is what's known as a data protection impact assessment. You know, do, do I have to do it? It's a risk-based, risk-based approach to, to how you process data. It may be that you're, you're a small organization out there who has very little personal data so I would always say that your starting point as an organization is to know your data, know what data it is that you hold. Is it that you just hold some te some um, phone numbers and some email addresses that you contact some of your clients on? Um, in terms of externally, um, obviously you've got your, your own internal in terms of your, your admin for your, your, your HR type stuff. But to, to know your data is really, really important. Ensure the security of processing. Um, I've already gone through some of the principles, but these ideas of um, the principle of data protection by design and by default. So what we mean here is if you are if you are going to be um, building any new systems, whether it's a new HR system or any kind of a system that you're building, um, at the outset, you need to be considering data protection by, by design. You need to ensure that you're putting mechanisms in place that ensures that you're safeguarding the rights of individuals out there. And you know you can come to us as an organisation, um, the, the Data Protection Commission, and you can you know you can request a, a consultation with ourselves, or you can re request advice from ourselves when you're doing these kind of things if you're not sure what way what way to, to begin. And then the final area of accountability is in the appoint the appointing and empowering of what we call data protection officers. I'm going to be touching on on the data protection officer shortly, but in essence, any organisation, any organization that's doing a large scale um, processing of personal data should have a DPO in place. Any of the public sector bodies and um, local authority bodies must have DPOs in place under, under the GDPR. I think this is important as well, bearing in mind some of, as I, as I mentioned earlier on, some of the, the relationships that will be, will be um, taking place amongst your, your, yourselves. So this whole accountability between a controller processor relationship. So if you are a data controller, um, and you are outsourcing an element of, as I say, payroll, as example, to a, to a processor. So, you know, good practice, the accountability set, states that you should be monitoring, monitoring them on an ongoing basis in different ways. You know, you can undertake, and I'm sure you probably do this anyway as part of best practice, but undertake external and internal audits, undertake inspections to make sure that everything is being done as, as it's set out. Um, follow-up actions, if there are any follow-up actions, you make sure that the things that you have set down that need to be addressed are being addressed. There's spot checks and regular reviews. But really, really important is that if you, if in a controller processor relationship, is to ensure that, that that contract is in place. And I know the guys here are probably going to touch on that later on in terms of um, some of the software that they have themselves and some of the, the contracts that, um, to template contracts for you to look at. But that's really, really important that you, you set out your, your, your contract, you set out your contract exactly what that relationship is, that if there's no ambiguity, it's very clear for people to know that this is, this is our role this is your role and this is what's expected and as i say to monitor to monitor that that, that contract is being is being adhered to 
The next piece then on the GDPR is about this whole idea of transparency. And again, as I said, at the, said a little while ago, this is a really, really important area for ourselves. So it's where the controller should take appropriate measures to provide any information relating to the process processing to the data subject in a concise, transparent, intelligible, and easy accessible form using clear and plain language, in particular for any information addressed specifically to a child. So there's a couple of really, really important things in this. The first thing is that it's now the onus is now on the controller to make sure that you're doing this, and it is something that is 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 being looked at by ourselves, and it is going to be one of the areas of, of key interest for ourselves going forward. In relation to the stuff that's underlined there, you know, we're all used to going online and you know having to go through these 30 and 40 pages of terms of conditions and privacy policies, and you know the days of them should be gone because the GDPR, what the GDPR is saying, as you can see here, that it must be done in a concise, transparent, intelligent, and easily accessible form. So, you know, you if you're doing privacy policies, if you're doing terms of, of, of conditions of use, whatever it is you're putting in place, you must be doing it in as easy a way as possible. And kind of set yourself a test. It doesn't necessarily say this within the GDPR, but I would always say, my advice to people is, kind of take that, that, that test of, now, does, would somebody of 14, 15 years of age understand what it is is written here? There was a very good example of um, one of the one of the big multinational social media multinationals did a, did a, a project there just before GDPR, where they actually took their terms of, or sorry, a privacy policy that they had um, that ran over 20 pages, and they condensed it down into a two-page document, and they got a focus group of children together to read both documents. Now, the children got more out of the two-page document than they got out of the, the 20, 25-page document. It's really, really important that you, you know, you need to let people know what you're doing with their data, and you need to do it in a way that's very, very easy for them to read, to understand, and to take in. So the requirements, when we say what are the requirements, so when we say, you know, you need to be transparent, well, what do you need to be transparent about? So when you're obtaining your personal data from individuals under the GDPR, this is what you need to be clear on. You need to be clear of the identity of the controller and if there's a data protection officer in place. You need to be very clear on what the purpose of the processing of that data is and what legal basis you're using. And there are a number of different legal bases and um, one of the most uh, common ones is the base of consent, but there are also other bases. For example, you can use it for a legitimate interest. You can use it if there's the performance of a contract and so forth. You also need to let them know who the recipients of the data is going to, is going to be. So if you are as the controller, if you're going to be sharing data with somebody else, um, and again, it might be the outsource, and maybe your outsourced um, processor, but you need to let them know that this, this arrangement is in place. Um, as you can see, any data transfer arrangements, also your retention period. So you should, as an organization, have a retention policy in place. And again, you know, if you're a small SME out there, you know, don't be thinking to yourself, oh my God, this means so much work for us. You just need to put a little bit of thought into it and have it documented in some way that this is how long I hold on to my data for, and this is my justifiable reason why we hold on to the data for this period of time. You need to let them know they have a right of access, that they have a right to, to access their information. You need to let them know that they have a right to withdraw consent at any time. So if you're processing um, data and you're using consent as a legal basis, well, individuals have got a right to withdraw that consent. They need to know they have a right to lodge a complaint with the supervisory authority, which is ourselves, the Data Protection Commission. And if there's any contractual or statutory basis, you need to let them know that. And then finally, if there is any automated decision making that's taking place, they need to know the details of that and that needs to be set out in your, and again, I don't know, but maybe that, that may be something that would be of relevance in, in the, this HR payroll sphere. I'm not sure how much automated decision making there is, but again, these are just a list of the, the types of things that you need to let people know and needs to be very, very clear um, at the outset when, when you're, you're obtaining the personal data from them. So these are the types of things that we see in action that just kind of to, 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 um, to show transparency. So again, privacy policies, I spoke about it earlier on, avoid the ambivalent terms, make it as easy to understand as, as possible. A bit of say presentation signposting, let people see what way you do your work, where they need to go to, to, um, to get information, whether it may be websites, um, visualize, visualization tools, like icons and seals and so forth. Um, and again, this is where you have your own website. 
you know, make sure that it's very, very clear for people when they go onto your website exactly what it is you do. And then that whole thing about what's known as testing intelligibility. And all that really means is that just, <laughs> it's a bit ironic that I have testing intelligibility. And what I'm actually saying is that it means to make it very easy to understand, <laughs> very easy to, to read. And, and I realize myself that I'm using the phrase. Um, but that's what it is. It's just a test that it is very easy for people to understand. And, you know, they're not left kind of scratching their heads saying, well, what does this mean? What does that mean? Um, there are, are exceptions on the obligations to provide information um, and, it's, and it's set out, it's set out in, in the GDPR, but it, it's in so far as the data subject already has the information. So again, people have the right, um, the right to access information from, from an organization, but it may be that you've already provided this information to an individual before. So, you know, data protection legislation, it, can't, it shouldn't be used by individuals to just become a nuisance with, with, with an employer, for example. So, you know, you can't just keep going and asking you for the same data over and over again that you've already provided. Um, where the provision of such information proves impossible or would involve a disproportionate effort or seriously impair the objectives of that processing. What's important here is though you must have documented why it is impossible for you to do it. You know, it, it, you can't, you as a, as, a, as a controller, data controller, can't just say, actually, you know what, it's impossible or it would be disproportionate. You have to be able to document why that would be the case, and in particular if somebody was to come and make a complaint to ourselves and um, further down the line, um, or where obtaining a disclosure is expressly laid down by a union or member state law. So there may be, there may be areas um, such as under criminal justice legislation where for, you know, somebody might want to access information, but there is a there is a reason why that that information wouldn't be, and um, it could have something to do with some sort of a criminal case, for example, that that might be coming down the line. So there, there are the, the two biggies really: accountability and transparency are the two big, big things that we take. And I hope I've kind of explained them somewhat there, and no doubt there will be some questions a little bit later on in relation to it. So moving on there to the next thing, which is this idea of a breach notification to a supervisory authority. So this is prior to the GDPR, um, which came in on the 25th of May, there was a kind of a code of conduct. So there was a voluntary practice whereby if there was a breach um, in an organization where for some reason they, they released information on, as a, a very recent example of 5,000 employees and um, information was, was released to the public um, erroneously. And um, in those circumstances, prior to the 25th of May, there was a voluntary uh, code, it was kind of best practice that they would notify ourselves and put a few things in place. However, under the G GDPR, it is now mandatory to notify ourselves or whichever supervisory authority across the EU, but for, for any of you guys to notify ourselves within 72 hours of you becoming aware of that breach. Un you don't have to notify us, however, un if it's unlikely to result in a risk to the rights or freedoms of an individual. Now, one of the difficulties for you um, is that this test is done by you. You decide whether it's likely or unlikely to result in that. So that's just something you need to be, be aware of. Um, I would say we are we're seeing a significant increase at the numbers of breach notifications to the office has trebled since the 25th of May, I say what you're probably seeing is a couple of things. Number one, because it's mandatory, we are now getting breach notifications that we may not have got in the past. However, we're probably also getting people who are kind of testing it themselves. They're not sure whether they should be sending it to us. They, 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 they're struggling to maybe make this call as to whether it is, it does meet this bar of, of um, being likely or unlikely to result in, in a risk. And um, so they're sending it to us. I would say another thing that's very important here, and sorry, just if I finish off on risk there, as you can see, when we talk about risk, it's a ris risk to the likes of identity theft or anything that's likely to lead to a financial loss for a data subject. And that would be very, very important for you guys in, in the sphere you're working. But just bearing in mind breach notifications here, in circumstances where you are a data controller and you may have a data processor working for you. So again, going back to the example of where you may have a bureau who you outsource your HR to, it is very important that you have something in that contract that you sign with them in relation to the notification, you be notified um, as the data controller of any breach that takes place. Because the legislation states that the breach notification is made to us by a data controller, not a processor. So therefore, it's important that where a processor has a breach of some sort that they become aware of, that you ensure that you have it in your contract, that they must notify you, and then you have, as I say, 72 hours 
um, within 72 hours. It's, it's without undue delay, but within 72 hours that you have to, to notify ourselves. I'm sorry, Gary, that's 72 hours. That's the clock starts ticking straight away. Yeah. Doesn't stop for the weekend. No, no, no. It's, um, and we've um, we've we've had to set up a, a system whereby we've got it. It's, it's all online with ourselves now. So if you're making a breach notification. You go onto our website. You make the, the notification to us online, um, and that's to take account of the fact that you know sometimes these things happen at five o'clock on a Friday evening. And yeah. um, you know, but it, whenever you become aware of it, as I say, it's without undue delay, but no more than seventy-two hours after. Then where where the personal data, again, this is the test for you guys to decide where the personal data breach is likely to result in a high risk to an individual. So earlier on we spoke about, if I just go back um, for a second, we spoke about it's unlikely to result in a risk to a person. If it's likely to result in a risk, you should notify us. If you make the call that it's likely to result in a high risk, to an individual so it's a higher threshold than just reporting to ourselves well then you need to communicate with the data subjects themselves you need to let them know that um what has happened and um, so it's really really important and it says in the legislation without undue delay again you need to determine what undue delay is but you know there needs to be an element they say of common sense and um, taken here in relation to this so we move on then on to consent um, and this is again this is, is an important and no doubt there will be questions we were speaking about it ourselves a short time ago in relation to consent in particular where you may have had say mailing lists pre prior to GDPR um, and you know do you have consent or do you not have consent it's very clear the GDPR is very clear and, and, it, and it, it turns things around previously um, and if I can give examples that I'm sure we've all had at some stage of where you would walk into a shop I remember walking into a to a, a retail shop early this year and going up to pay for something and I was asked for my email address so they could give me a send me my receipt um, electronically and I gave that email address now that email address is taken from me there and then to send me my receipt that's what I'm told so under no circumstances should I then start receiving emails and um, marketing emails from that shop um, to say we're having sales or, or whatever. Um, prior to GDPR, um, I, I, could, I, I was asked to opt, I could opt, opt out of it. Whereas now it's very, very clear that you need to opt in. The individual is making an affirmative action so it's the starting point is not is no longer and again we'll all have seen it at some stage where you go on to onto a, a website where you've got the little tick box and it's click here if you don't you want, want to receive, receive stuff that's changed the gdpr is very clear you now must tick this box if you want to receive so it's an actual affirmative action by an individual and that's very very important so you know we can talk about it as i say no doubt there'll be some questions in relation to that um, but in particular around for those of you who are, who are um, you know, some of the SMEs out there who, who for say marketing purposes do use um, do use email addresses or, or phone numbers, there's nothing wrong with using them as long as the purpose for which you received um, those email addresses or those phone numbers, you were very clear with the individual when you got it that you will, you do intend to use it for these purposes and the person has, has signed up and has actually opted in to that. So we, we mentioned, um, and I'll just, I'll just touch on these very briefly, but I mentioned some of the new and enhanced data subject rights that have come under the GDPR. So the first one here is the right to data portability, then there's the right to be informed, to rectification, right of access, right of erasure, right for an organization to restrict, for an individual to have an organization restrict processing, or right to object to processing. So just to go through a couple of them, some of them are relatively self-explanatory, but the right to data portability, so this is where an individual can ask an organization to, or to ask a controller that they want to move their data from one organization to another. So an example of that may be in the insurance industry, let's say the health insurance industry, where I want to move from one health service provider to another, and I can request that it's, it's, my data is, is transferred. Um, and it must be done in a structured, commonly used and machine readable format. That's what the legislation says. So, you know, there's no, I suppose, playing silly beggars here and, and sending it off in, the, in a really hard to understand. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So this is this is to be done in a very easy, and again, it's, it's just empowering the, the, the individual at the under, other end of it. 
Um, the right to be informed, you know, the right to be informed of, of, of what, and I've kind of touched on it all earlier on when we spoke about transparency, you know, to, the right for the individual to be informed as to what you're going to be doing with the data, the right to rectif rectification. So an individual data subject out there has the right to ask a, a, a controller. So if you hold data on me, um, and it could be any type of data, but if I know that you hold data on me that I know is incorrect, well, I can get you as the controller without undue delay, is what the legislation says, to rectify the inaccurate personal data that you hold but be belonging to me. The right of access is really important, and I'm sure you guys, um, because we see quite a lot, the right of access complaints that we receive normally relate, quite a significant number of them relate to employer-employee relationships. I think Jenny was saying from the phones here, that's definitely an area where we've seen calls come in where employers yeah. have had those requests. Yeah. So we had, just last year, if I, um, we, we received over 2,500 complaints last year, 52% of those complaints related to right of access issues and a significant number of those I said earlier and um, they related to employer employee relationships so where an employee goes to you and seeks to have um, copies of what it is you hold on them there's been a change under the GDPR it has gone from what used to be 40 days down to 30 days and there's now no no fee attached to this so where an individual requests their their and um, their data you must provide it to them within that period of time and that's really, really important. Um, and as I say, it's 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 an area that we get lots and lots of complaints on. Again, go back to some of the stuff I said earlier on. However, if you've given somebody some data that they've received, and just very, I suppose something practical, if you've given somebody data that they've requested, um, and they come back to you then six months later and look for all the data you hold on them, well, like there would be an expectation that it's only for the previous six months you've already provided them all of the all of the stuff there's lots of there's lots of the bigger there's a lot of really good practice out there now with the bigger multinationals and um, like if i if i if i take facebook as an example they've now got a download tool themselves on their on their platform whereby if you want to see what information facebook holding you you can go in and use this tool that allows you yourself to download all of the information that they hold on you so there's, there's lots of ways, that depending on, on, on I suppose, the, the need and the size of an organization and the type of data that they hold. Some of the kind of, from what we've learned, people we've talked to, again, if it's an employee request to access their data, and it might be an employee who's been with you for the last 20 years, so you have a mountain of information on them. Um, obviously, you want to comply and you want to give them the information, but we would suggest maybe engaging with them as much as possible. And it may be something like, you even asking them, well, what information do you want and what's it in relation to so it'll just maybe whittle down yeah. what you need to do in terms of going through that big lever arch folder for that individual and you know and, and that might just help that oh i'm only looking for information with regard to a certain topic uh, yeah and it might just make your your life a little bit easier yeah 100 percent. yeah definitely and and even when when individuals come to ourselves with these right of access complaints the very first thing we say mm -hmm. to them is you know what process have you gone through with the employer if it's if it's employer employee and we actually advise them you know notwithstanding the fact that they can make the complaint and we can accept it and start start looking at it, but we say it might be an idea for you just to go back to the employer just tell them that you've been in contact with ourselves almost like giving you another chance but you know just to kind of let the end you know the majority of people what they're looking for is to get their information and so, you know, they don't necessarily want the long drawn out process yeah. where they're coming to us and there's an investigation takes place and so forth. Yeah. So let's go back to the employee, employee or employer as an employee. And as Laura said, as the employer, there's absolutely nothing wrong with you actually asking the individual, is there a specific element of your information? Like we do have 20 years of information from you. Are you looking for it all? And if they are, well, you know, they have a right to access it. But is there a specific element of it that, that you're actually looking for? And um, moving on then to the next one is a right to a erasure of erasure. So an individual has got um, a right. This is also known as the right to be forgotten. And people may be familiar. It gets a little bit of media attention. But a, a data subject does have the right um, to erase the personal data concerning them without without any undue delay, provided that as an organisation for you as a data controller, that information is or that personal data is no longer necessary. The consent is withdrawn. The data subject objects if it's been unlawfully processed 
for obvious reasons, you know, you should not be doing that. But an individual has got the right to request that information that you hold on them when you no longer require that information, no longer need that information, that that information can be raised. We see it quite a lot with the social media platforms and with some of the search engines. There's some of the, I suppose, the higher profile where people might go to the likes of, for example, Google and say to Google, um, you have information there in relation to me that, um, and there's been quite a lot of um, court cases in, in, in this regard, but you hold information, you have information in your search engine there, if you put in my name, you can see I was involved in a criminal trial 10 years ago, I may have been convicted, but I'm now, you know, I've served my time and I wanted to have my, my information erased from the platform. Um, and there are a couple of things that they can look at if there's a public interest to keeping information they can do so in your circumstances and maybe you 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 know you might have some sort of a legal or um, statutory obligation to hold on to it for a period of time but again it, it is a, it is a new and enhanced right for for data subjects the right to restrict processing um, and again this is where if an individual has a if they're contesting things such as the accuracy of the data that you are that you, that you hold on them or that you are processing or where they feel that that processing is unlawful so for example if you aren't we spoke i spoke touched earlier on about the legal basis you know if if an individual feels that you don't have a legal basis for why you are processing their data and that's why you need to be very informed yourself and care for yourself at the outset that you know what your legal basis is are you using consent are you using a legitimate interest is there a contract and so forth um, and then the final one there is there that, that an individual has got the right to object at any time to processing of personal data where it's based on, uh, what's it, and again, the legislation says uh, the performance of a task carried out in the public interest or in the exercise of official authority. So there, just to touch on, bearing in mind I've only got whatever, half an hour or so to, to talk, they're trying to get through the new enhanced rights um, as quick as I can. Just to touch on administrative fines then, and again, don't want to be striking fear in everybody here that, you know, as an organization, we're going to be out. Yes, if, if it's required and we're required, we will be using, our own commissioner has been very strong, she will be using the full toolkit that's been provided to us under the GDPR, and that is up to a, a maximum of 20 million euro of uh, turnover in the preceding year, or sorry, up to 20 million euro or up to 4% of global turnover for the preceding financial year, whichever is greater. And, um, you know, the reality is if you're an SME out there and you don't have to be worried about the fact that we're going to be coming after you for 20 million euro, there's obviously, you know, there's 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 going to be, a, a it's going to be looked at the effect that it has on organizations so forth. This is all going to be tested out over the coming months and years in terms of there will be guidance um, coming from, from across the EU. But I suppose just to to, um, to say on this, as an organization, and some of you guys may already have experienced this, but as an organization, we take a two-pronged approach to regulation. This is the enforcement side, but we also take a very much, we take an engaged approach with organization. And in particular, we've done a lot of work with the SME sector um, in the build of the GDPR, where we would meet with, meet with organizations. We try and provide them with as much guidance as possible. Um, and try and help them. I spoke earlier on. If you're, you know, you're setting up a new system and you're looking for any sort of guidance in terms of your whole idea of privacy by by design or by default. And um, so we do try and work with, with organisations. But this is the toolkit that's being provided. And then the final, the final one I have is just and I touched on it earlier on a data protection officer. So any public authority or body must have a data protection officer in place. Any organisation where the core activities consist of processing operations which require regular and systematic monitoring of data subjects on a large scale. So again, you make that call yourselves, and no doubt there are some of you guys out there already have DPOs in place, or where there's processing on a large scale of what's known as special categories of data. So that's um, that's me done. Just to, to, to just say in terms of, I have touched in terms of numbers, um, since the 25th of May, I said last year we'd received, in the whole year we'd received two and a half thousand complaints. So far already up until last week from the 25th of May, we received 1,300 complaints. We've received almost 2,000 breach notifications um, from, from organizations. The workload has increased um, considerably as an organization. Our, our resourcing has increased as well. We've gone from um, an organization that had 30 staff back in 2013, we're up to 105 at the moment, and we've got 100, around 140 by the end of this year. 
and somewhere between 180 to 200 next year. So, you know, there's been significant investment by government in data protection, and um, as 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 you know, I'm sure you guys have seen it through through the media and so forth. So, it's an area that, that that's growing and uh, certainly isn't going away. I hope that's useful, and as I said, I look forward to any questions that you might have. In a short time. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Graham. I know I have loads of questions there, and comments, and I know I've learned. Um, loads from that as well. I think it's a topic that we could talk about all day. Um, we're doing a little bit of musical chairs here at the moment, so just bear with us for a moment. Um, my colleague Jenny's going to step in as well, and we're just going to. A lot. There's actually a lot of overlap and a crossover um, from what Graham has already said. Um, so we may just fly through this very quickly, but we want to just look at it. Um, obviously, we've been looking at it in a general view, bring it down to a, an employee and payroll processing um, element. So uh, firstly, I suppose if we just look at all that information that you hold on your on people, I won't say even employees, because the information that you hold in, in relation to HR, um, it could be from inf information that's gained through the recruitment process. So even regardless as to whether an individual actually ended up getting the job, you've got their CV in as well. So it's coming, it's right at that early stage. Obviously, it's all the information that you hold on your current employees, their name, address, payroll information, next to kin, performance reviews that you've had, and, and particularly then also any sick leave records as well. Um, and then you'll have all that information on levers as well. So it's a huge amount of information. Um, and one question that we've got a lot about as well is like, what, what does it matter which format that information is held in? And, and no, it doesn't. So you might have the old lever arch hard copy files, and you might, or you might have a HR new system, a payroll system, a check-in technology, even email. All of the above, GDPR will, will apply to them. It's regardless of where the information um, is held. Um, but what's important to remember that, again, regardless of where it is, um, the GDPR will, will, will apply. Um, just, just a few brief points. Again, this is kind of repeating a lot of what Graham has said, but in terms of being able to demonstrate compliance, the, some of the core considerations that you might want to look at is, again, is the lawful process. And, um, there are six criteria that you must be able to meet, at least one of them, and we'll come back to this. Jenny's going to pop in to talk about your lawful processing. Uh, your employee data must be kept up to date and only used for the purposes of which you've communicated to the employee. You're only holding information then for as long as needed. So again, your retention period is really, really important when you're thinking about the employee data that you hold. Um, and again, ensuring that your data is stored and processed in a secure manner. And again, that's regardless of where you hold your data. Um, the hard copies need to be locked down as well, which we've come across cases and questions on that as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, your lawful processing. So processing of personal data can only de be deemed as lawful if it meets um, one of the six legal reasons as set out by GDPR. So the first one there is that the data subject has given consent. I'm going to look at consent a little bit more in detail in a little bit. Um, that it's necessary for the performance of a contract or to take steps prior to entering into a contract. Um, if it's necessary for the compliance with the legal obligation to which the controller is subject. So in this case, you know, the employee-employer relationship, the employee has, employer has to pay you, therefore has to pay forward the taxes to the relevant authorities. Um, in order to protect the vital interests of a person, um, if it's necessary for the public interest or the official authority, and again, this is going back to more of the um, kind of public sector bodies. Um, and then the final one then is the legitimate interests of the data controller or yourself, the employer in this case. Um, and this is where you can have a little bit more flexibility in classifying your processing. Um, but just touching on consent there, in relation to the employee-employer relationship, employee consent is no longer permissible under GDPR. So employers really do need to look at some of the other grounds for lawful processing in order to justify the processing of HR or payroll data. And um, so more than likely that's going to be, um, you know, where it's necessary for the compliance of legal obligation, as we said, your taxes there, um, i.e. if you process your payroll, you're legally obliged to pay the employee, deduct and pay for those taxes. Um, for the performance of a contract, i.e. your employment contract there with the individual as well. Um, and then finally, it, if it is in the legitimate interests of the business to do so. Um, you know, and that could be just in, in the interest to hold performance records, things like that. So employers really do need to give thought to each separate piece of employee data that they process and record the grounds for the law of processing on which they rely on in each of those cases. Okay, so there's our three options that employers are going to look at there. Trevor, just to pick up on what you're saying there about consent, um, there 
because in most cases we won't rely on consent from processing employee data anymore. Um, up until May, of course, one of the most commonly relied upon grounds for processing data was consent. Um, however, as Graham has already said, consent must be freely given, specific, informed and unambiguous. Um, so, but given the imbalance of power then between your employees and your employers, the power being with the employer, it'll be difficult for consent to be freely given by employees. So, therefore, it is unlikely that consent is going to be a valid basis for, basis for processing HR. Now, for HR data, the main pieces of HR data, your payroll information, performance reviews, etc. In some cases, um, a lot of larger companies might rely on consent, maybe if they're processing records like diversity records. But I think um, for the most part, consent and employee data wouldn't be what I'd be relying upon. Um, and historically, when we talked about processing employee data, there might have been a data protection clause in the contract of employment that said, you know, you're an employee and we'll process your data. And that was that, was that really. Um, but in terms of that contract, that's no longer going to be sufficient and you're going to have to have a, a, a range of more information in the privacy policy that Graham has, has, has suggested. Certainly, it's still advisable to have some form of clause in the contract, but it'll be much more, it'll be different than what we've had before. Exactly. Um, I'm going to fly through this slide because I know we, we talked a lot about the enhanced rights and we've definitely done the right of access. Um, but just the increased rights, and if we look at them in relation to employees, we've just picked out three of the ones that, that Graham talked about earlier. But the one that I really wanted to talk about was the right to be informed. Um, and this emphasizes the need for transparency. And that was, again, a key word that we've learned today. Um, so the need for transparency in how you use your personal data. And you must be very clear with your data subjects, and that's your employees in this in this regard, about how you use their data. Their, their data. Um, and as you've already seen, you must provide them with information including the purposes of processing their data, your retention periods for that personal data, and who will that data be shared to. So when we think about that, how, how do you inform your employees about that? The main the key piece here would be an employee privacy policy. And I think for many companies, particularly the SMEs that we would do, I would know that this employee privacy policy might be a new thing in your company, but it's certainly worthwhile putting in place if you're to tick that box around um, transparency and how you process your, your employee data. Um, exactly. Um, so the right of access, we've, we've already touched on, I won't go through that. Um, but one of the recommendations under GDPR is a self-service option. So Rachel's actually going to show you um, our self-service option and connect a little more, a uh, little further on. The right to rectification. So Article 16 of GDPR states that individuals have the right to have an accurate personal data rectified, um, you know, or, or completed if it is incomplete. And, um, you know, so those kind of three enhanced rights are quite specific in relation to the payroll processing aspect aspect you know that we look at um, with you guys uh, that are here today. Perfect so Jenny's just mentioned the the, um, the recommended self-service option so under this again we'll go back to transparency the da and data subjects having should having access and easy access to the data being held on them the GDPR legislation includes a best practice recommendation and I let's say it is only a recommendation for businesses to provide individuals with a secure self-service platform offering remote access to the information held on them. So an employee self-service, what is it? It's usually an online service that, again, provides employees with access to their personal records. So whether that is their contracts, their handbook, any letters, documentation, probation letters, annual leave, all that kind of information that you might have usually in your employee file. Um, and again, different systems will have different features in terms of what, what else can be available. Um, so I think for employers who, again, are looking to implement best practice and put their best foot forward in terms of GDPR, looking at a self-service option could be worthwhile, well worthwhile. So again, moving on really quickly, conscious of time and conscious of the level of questions that are coming in as well. I just want to look at a few specifics in terms of payroll processing um, and the distribution of pay slips. Again, this is where, an area where we've had huge amount of questions come in. Um, and I just want to say in relation to email pay slips, there is absolutely nothing in the GDPR legislation that states that it is no longer permissible to email pay slips. Um, what is really important that if you are emailing pay slips that you take all the security measures possible to ensure that you know, the security of the information and the data that, that's being sent through. Um, so definitely passwords. Um, 
And again, it's a question that we've had on our helpline, what happens if I set the one generic password for all my employees' employees' payslips? We wouldn't recommend it. No. And we'd certainly advise that you have individual <laughs> passwords that employees set for their own. Um, and again, Jay, I think the same applies on the pay, on the postal side of payslips. Absolutely, yeah. There's nowhere in the GDPR legislation that states it's no longer permissible to post the payslips. What you need to be conscious of, as Laura's just said, is that all appropriate um, you know, technical and organisational measures or security measures are in place to protect that. And that could be as simple as using a security envelope and um, marking uh, confidential on the outside of it, or even, you know, using registered post. Um, or as Laura's touched on there, the other option is, is to offer that self secure self-service portal um, to send and store your payslips as well. Yeah, so just on the, the self-service portal, again, that should be password protected for every employee. And again, you don't want generic or identical passwords. Um, it should be unique passwords. Um, accessing, so on your portal, accessing payslips and personal contact details through a remote access secure system. It just provides flexible flexibility and again transparency that keyword for our employees and um, a self-service portal offers it does offer significant benefits for your data controllers and processes to comply with the legislation um, and then that 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 remote access it ensures people can access it 24 7 and hopefully if you, if you have if you do decide to go with a self-service option it will help you deal with those employee um access data requests. access requests that may come in because <laughs> employees already have the ability to to get that information online as well and um, so we just finish off with security on that yeah the security so i mean when it comes to the payroll data really organization organizations should be looking at the likes of password protection on your pcs or devices that hold that personal payroll data and um, you know so the pc that somebody has the payroll software on obviously the payroll software itself should be password protected and um, just in case anybody else has access to that pc the payslips we've already discussed should have the password protection or the security payslips um, and then simple things like you know you mightn't even consider but having like a clean desk policy in place making sure the likes of um paper timesheets or payroll documents are stored in, in a secure cabinet or a lockable cabinet um, and somebody um an event we went to before somebody mentioned even having your shredding box at the bottom of the printer and um, you know and having a policy in place that once a week yeah and as you say jenny it's a simple one but mm. we've come across that if you're a payroll bureau and you have I don't know, you have a number of employees and they each are working on different clients and then yeah. somebody goes home in the evening and leaves, you know, just leaves their client files on the desk, maybe even turned over. They thought they closed the folder. That's not really secure. You don't know what who else is around the office exactly. when they've left. And um, so they're just the kind of the day to day, even simple things that you, you can help to, to protect the data. Exactly. That's it. Okay, so the data processor agreement or the relationships or the contract between a data processor and a data controller. And then again, Graham has touched on this and hopefully this will either embed its importance or explain it further for you, but we, we'll have a look at this. Um, so I, I've kind of done my own little graph in terms of who processes the payroll um, and who has what responsibility. So looking here first, where business processes their own payroll in-house, so they do it themselves, they are both the data controller and the data processor. Um, so hopefully you can that that's clear there. Um, where a business outsources their payroll to an accountant or to a payroll bureau, then the data, sorry, then the bureau is the data processor and the employer is the data controller. The payroll data processor can lawfully process the data on behalf of the client as long as there is a written contract in place. And, and that's really important. And we want, we want to come back to this contract um, in more detail about what, what should be in it or um, and how to put it in place, I suppose. I think, Jenny, then you just I'm wanted sorry. to... Just on the employees then, and the final point on the employees is that in an outsourced relationship and in the payrolls, in, the, in a payroll situation where that is outsourced, we get a lot of questions as to whether the payroll bureau needs written consent from the, their, their clients' employees. Um, but the answer is no. What is important is that the employee should be clearly informed that the payroll is being processed externally and it is, it is um, outsourced. But in terms of the processor, the, the payroll bureau, they don't need to receive information or approval from the employee. It's in that situation, it's the employer's obligation to inform the employees. Yeah, yeah. I'm getting the nod from Gray. So <laughs> I think I'm okay. Great. If you wanted to, to jump in no, at any point. Um, 
So just the data process. So this is the contract and it's really important. So the contract is important so that both parties understand their responsibilities and their liabilities. Now controllers, so the employer in most cases here, are, li are liable for their compliance with GDPR and they must only appoint processors who can provide sufficient guarantees that the requirements of the GDPR will be met and that the rights of the data subjects protected. And again, that's kind of going back on one of brain slides as well. So the onus is on the employer, the data controller, to ensure that the correct contract is in place. Um, however, although the onus is on the data controllers to ensure that, again, the contract is in place, our advice to a lot of our payroll bureaus is that, you know, when it comes to GDPR, you may see yourself be, being an educator or informing your clients about this. So if, you, if your client hasn't come to you regarding a DPA or the contract, we would kind of advise even maybe taking the initiative and, and contacting them about it as well. Um, and as again, and then a, just a, a change and or a new change under the, under the GDPR. Previously, a lot of the responsibility just lay lay with the controller. Now, with, with GDPR, the data processor does have some direct responsibilities as well, and they can too be subject to the fines and other sanctions that apply. Exactly. Um, so you're probably all confused now what does this contract look like or what it is now, and we know a lot of payroll bureaus that we deal with or our customers who have payroll bureaus you 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 might have a contract on already in place or you might you you might call it a term of service and a ULA an engagement letter they law still apply um but the under GDPR what must be included in your terms of service has increased and there's now more specific information that you need to include again around the responsibilities, the security and uh, the important point that Graham mentioned earlier about what happens if there's a breach, are you notified? So there's certain, um, more, there's more information that needs to be in those contracts. Now what we've been saying to to customers and or to people that we speak to, to certainly if you have a contract in place, you might not want to reissue the whole new contract mm -hmm. and you could um, issue an addendum to any ex existing contract and we would call this the data processor agreement or data processor um, addendum to that. To assist our customers um, and to source software, we've created um, a template data processor agreement. We've written it coming from a, a payroll bureau relationship so it will be written with regard to the type of information that a, a payroll bureau and that relationship would, would need um, and that's available on our website I think we're going to send a link um, after the webinar to that as well okay so just um, going through it again quickly just how to source software can help um, you're all familiar now, we have a, a range or a suite of products that have been updated to assist you with GDPR compliance. And uh, for those of you who use BrightPay payroll software, the products connect in a similar manner um, with the BrightPay Connect Cloud add-on. Um, but firstly, you'll see our Bright Contracts. Jenny's just going to take you through a very short um, a few couple of slides on how Bright Contracts can help you with GDPR. Absolutely. So our, our Bright Contract software basically allows the user to create and manage legally compliant employment contracts and customizable staff handbooks with all of the kind of required and recommended policies from an employment law perspective. Um, and the likes of having your, you know, your contracts and your personal data, like the privacy policies in a program, which has already built in encryption and security measures, means the employer is demonstrating compliance with the GDPR regulations around the security of that data. Now, as Graham has already mentioned, the transparency requirement is a huge thing with GDPR. And GDPR stipulates that anywhere personal data is being collected, privacy notices should be in place. So these are the policies that are critical to complying with the transparency obligations within GDPR. Now, what we've done with the Bright Contract software, the HR software, is we've actually introduced um, an employee privacy policy on the software. So this policy covers the required elements and ensures kind of demonstrable compliance in regard to the employer's obligations that are required under GDPR. So we'll take it just a very quick look at that privacy policy now. Um, so one of the, the main principles is that your data should be processed lawfully, fairly and in a transparent manner. These three elements generally overlap and all three must be satisfied in order to demonstrate that compliance. And employers, as, as we've just seen, as both data controllers and processors must be able to show how they comply with the new data protection principles and be clear and open with their employees about what data they process um, and the um, data subject rights. So the Bright Contract software includes a new employee privacy 
policy feature. So employers can actually facilitate that main GDPR principle of lawful, fair and transparent processing um, of the employee information. Um, and it's very simple. Literally all the employee needs to do is select two compulsory sections um, relating to whether or not any automated decision making occurs in relation to the data. And that could be down to like a, uh, some kind of recruitment system in relation to selecting possible job applicants. Um, and then the second one is the international transfer. So whether or not any of the personal data is transferred or stored outside of the European economic area. Once you've got those two, two compulsory sections selected, there are kind of company specific sections that you can then select. Um, and the system will then, based on that, generate a compliant employee privacy policy indicating what the GDPR stipulates, which is what data is processed, how it was collected, with whom it's been shared, any third parties like the likes of your pension providers, your accountants, the retention periods, the rights of the individual, i.e. the right of access, the right to rectification that we've looked at there. Um, the privacy policy is critical to complying with the transparency obligations in the employee-employer relationship. So it is vital that they have the correct and appropriate information and that it's presented, as Graham has already mentioned there, in a clear and understandable format. So Bright Contracts has done all that for you. Um, and basically with the, you know, selecting those few items, the system will generate that employee privacy policy for you, enabling the employer to tick off another box regarding that GDPR compliance. Perfect. I just hope you can still hear me because I've just moved over a little bit. Um, obviously, the privacy policy is really important in informing in informing your employees about how their data is uh, used and what you do with it. Another change that we've made to the Bright Contracts software for our Bright Contracts users um, is our data protection policy, and um, that's in within with, that's always been held within the handbook. And we've updated this um, now in relation to what your employees should do in relation to the sensitive data that they may be dealing with um, in regard to their your clients or in, in the course of their duties. Um, and the new data protection policy here includes information about how security and what your employees should do if they see a breach or if they think there's a breach, who they should report it to and what the next steps will be. So that's um, another useful policy as well. Absolutely. So. Um there is obviously a lot more information on the Bright Contracts from uh, the website and um, you can request a free online demo in the questionnaire at the end of the webinar um, itself. So I'm going to pass you on to Rachel now who's going to have a look at our self-service option. Okay, yeah. so now looking at our Connect add-on product which is available to work alongside both Bright Pay Payroll and the Source Payroll Manager. The Source Connect and BrightPay Connect are tailored to help you overcome some of the key challenges GDPR presents when processing payroll. Essentially, the Source Connect and BrightPay Connect are automated cloud backups, keeping employees' payroll and personal data safe and secure. The payroll itself is still processed on your desktop application. However, the payroll information is stored online on a secure cloud server. So because the payroll information is stored online, uh, you have the ability to invite your employees to their own password protected self-service portals. So going back to what Laura said earlier with the GDPR, it is recommended to provide remote access to a secure system, which would provide employees with direct access to their personal data. With Connect, both employers and employees can log in 24 seven on any device, including PCs, Macs, tablets, and smartphones. So next is Secure Document Exchange. Uh, the self-service portal facilitates the secure transfer of payroll documents between employers and their employees. Rather than sending confidential documents through emails, employers can provide these to employees in a secure environment. Or if you are a payroll bureau, you can also invite your clients to their own employer dashboard, where your payroll client can run their own payroll reports and view payroll information for each of their employees. And this allows the payroll bureau to automatically and securely send sensitive documents to their client without the need to attach them to an email. With the employee self-service portal, employees can update their own personal information, making sure details are accurate and up to date. This feature also helps with the right to rectification of personal data held, which is an employee right under the GDPR. Users can be set up so that they only have access to the information needed to complete their duties, ensuring privacy by default. So here you may have a manager who should have permission to approve leave requests, 
but who has no reason to have access to the payroll information. Last but not least then, Connect acts as an all-in-one central location to store all things employee related, including payroll, HR and other employment related documents. Having individual employee documents visible to the employee promotes transparency across your people function. So just to have a very look, quick look at Connect then, here we have the employer dashboard. And this is what Brightpay Connect and the source Connect look like for employers processing their own payroll in-house. And it is also what it looks like for both the payroll bureau and their clients. The employer can access pay slips and payroll documents for each of their employees. They can view and run their own payroll reports. Employers can view a company-wide employee calendar showing past and scheduled leave for all employees. Within the revenue tab, employers can view amounts due to HMRC and, or sorry, to revenue and a full breakdown of the P30. Employers can also upload HR documents and confidential employee information, so such as their contract of employment or their privacy policy. Moving on now to the individual employee, and um, as mentioned earlier, employees can log in remotely to a self-service portal as recommended by the GDPR. So employees can log in on any internet browser, or there is also a smartphone app where employees can log in and get notifications directly to their smartphone device. Uh, the employee can view and download current pay slips, or they can see historic pay slips and payroll documents, such as their P60. Uh, going into the HR documents and resources, here the employee can view employee documents that have been uploaded by their employer. Next is calendar, and here employees can access an overview of all past and scheduled leave. They can also request annual leave instantly and view their annual leave entitlements and leave balance for the year. And finally, there's my details, where the employee can update basic personal details such as their phone number or their postal address. So I'm just going to pass you back to Laura here again. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Rachel. Excuse me. I just Brilliant. Just before we finish up our, our presentation and get into the Q&As, just um, a little bit about what we've done um, ourselves here in Source. And I suppose data protection has always been a concern for us, and we've always aimed to, to act with complete integrity in this regard. But like all companies in preparing for GDPR, we we have had to take um, we've had to take a stock and to make a total review on how we gather and maintain and use data and actually interesting just something that, that Graham said earlier you know the first point is really your data impact assessment and what data you hold and how you use that um, and I was just thinking you know internally when we did that here we just did it you know it wasn't a very complicated complicated process although it did take some time but we used an excel spreadsheet it was very simple it doesn't have to be anything um excessive or fancy at all. Um, just in relation to our software products, as I said, we are 100% committed to data by design and security. Um, but just the first point to point out is both, all of our products are desktop, um, by paid source and by contracts are desktop applications that sit on your own computer. So we never have access to your data files except when they've been submitted for support reasons. And um, so we've no control over the authority, the quality or the safety of that data input. And um, whilst we, we do have security measures in place to protect your data, it remains your own responsibility um, to keep your sign in details confidential and to close your PC when you're finished when you when you're finished using it. Um, but just in terms of the things that we have done, um, so I'll start off I suppose um, from time to time when we are assisting our, our customers with an employee query, we do we can request a backup of your employer file to fully resolve the customer query. And um, so whilst we did have security protocols in place for this, we felt that we could make them even more secure and we've created um, an in-program support support feature that automatically sends your backup up to, um, to us through a secure channel um, and that it never gets saved onto any of our PCs and it's automatically deleted after a period of time as well. Um, privacy policy, obviously the key, another key takeaway from today, we have updated our own privacy policies and um, we aimed to make it as easy to understand and simple to read and hopefully you'd agree, but it's available on the website as well. Um, over the last year, we've completed internal IT audits on all our own company PCs. We've deleted, uh, securely deleted any unnecessary files and data, um, and we, we're kind of making it a practice going forward that we hold these little 
we call the mini in IT audits, we're holding them regularly as well, just to kind of keep it up because GDPR is something that's ongoing. It's not a tick box now, I've done it, I'm finished. It, it's an ongoing thing. Um, we've looked at how information is sent to and retrieved from our secure service, be it for the purposes of maintaining our websites or our CRM system. We've changed all our servers over to a more secure Microsoft Azure, um, and we've also introduced some IP whitelisting, so it's no longer just uh, enough to have login credentials. You have to be coming from a trusted location as well. Um, marketing, we've introduced, I think think about our marketing lists, we've introduced addi additional consent fields on different areas of our software and, and websites, um, explicitly asking people for their consent to opt in to our newsletters, etc., where you find out about all our fantastic webinars. So I'd certainly say if you haven't already ticked the consent box, please do. Um, and then just one final quick point internally, we have held a number of internal training sessions with our staff just to keep everybody informed. And again, we hold them ongoingly as, as we get more on an ongoing basis, as we get more questions in on the support lines and as things develop as well. So we're trying to keep on, on top of it as best we can as well. Um, okay, so I think there's loads of questions coming in. Rachel's going to call them out too. As we'll just sit back now and Graham has joined us again. Um, Okay, so yes, there's lots of questions coming through there. Um, the first question here, where do we stand with holding CVs? We regularly get handed CVs looking for work. Can we keep these or is there a time frame that we should destroy them? Uh, we're talking about retention periods and I think this one is something that's up to the company to decide how long they might keep a, um, a CV that's just come in on spec and you might decide you'll hold it for a year or whatever you decide really but once you have a justifiable reason as to why you are going to hold it for that length. That's exactly time. it yeah that's it and, and just to say not just on CVs but on any data any personal data that you're looking to hold on hold on to um, the kind of the rationale that we may I may need it in the future we may need it but there's no you know, no definitive period of time for which you'd want to hold on to it was not an acceptable, it's not an acceptable reason for, for holding on to, to, to personal data. So as, as Laura said, I think with CVs, um, just set out your, your rationale in your, in your retention period. Okay. Is there a template for completing an impact assessment? I think I might have just come to that. <laughs> I got to you before. <laughs> Um, there are some questions that you might need to include where you got the information and, and why you held it. Um, there's, there's a list on the, DP, on the DPC website for that. I was just about to come to that. Yeah, we've got a microsite called gdprandu.ie. Um, and I just draw your attention to three different um, three different guidance pieces on that. So in the resources element of that website, we've got a DPI, DPIA guidance document. And it's very, very very useful and um, there's quite a lot in it and it goes through <clears throat> it goes through what a data protection impact assessment is what are the benefits how do I know why should conduct one and when is one not required there's quite a lot of information in it that will will, will, will help you the second thing then which I would actually think would be a huge benefit to a lot of organizations out there and the feedback on it has been very positive we have a guidance document that's preparing your organization for the general data protection regulation and it's a guide for SMEs and there's actually a checklist on that you'll see it it's not a it's not a very long um, document but there is a checklist on it um, and when you go through the checklist it really gets you it gets you to know where you are in terms of being compliant with the GDPR so it talks about personal data data access rights and um, your accuracy and retention your transparency so you'll fill out a number of fields on this and it is actually an, expert, an excel spreadsheet and um, type thing so you fill out this and it gives you an idea yourself as an organization uh, where you may have some gaps that need to be filled in yeah, yeah and just when we were doing that just kind of a lesson that i learned um that i kind of did it myself and realized and then i was chatting to somebody and they said well, what about this and then someone else and oh, what about that and i realized you can't, it's not something that one person can do. It's best to get a few people around the table and just take whatever, take a bit of time and, and trash it out because there'll always be something that you forget or you know, you've never thought of, oh, will you hold that on that? And something else will always pop up. Okay. <coughs> uh, do the transparency requirements need to be written form or verbal? We take names, addresses, and contact details to be able to visit the customer and insert this on the invoice at the end of the job. Can you repeat that again, please? <laughs> Due to the transparency requirement, um, do they need to be in written form or verbal? 
They take names, addresses and contact details to be able to visit the customer and then insert it on the invoice at the end of the job. Well, I think there, if, if somebody's been invoiced, if they're doing a job for somebody, then there's obviously some form of a contract in place. I think there might be, maybe that person's a little bit confused about consent. A consent, yeah, maybe, yeah, as yeah, opposed to yeah. transparency, I think, yeah. Mm. Okay. Uh, we process payroll for a UK-based company with a large number of Irish-based employees. Is it our responsibility to notify the individual employees on the information we hold, or do we need to notify the UK company and they notify their employees? Well, if I'm getting it right, the UK company are the data controller. Mm -hmm. um, so the, this group here is just a data processor. The processor yeah. So it's the obligation is on the data controller. Um, and I suppose from the processor <clears throat> here in Ireland's perspective, the important thing for them is to make sure in, they have their contract in place with the controller and they've set out exactly what their role is, what the controller's role is and so forth. Exactly, yeah. The, the, it would be up to the controller, i.e. the employer, to inform their employees that there is a third party involved and that should be done by like their employee privacy policy then. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, next question then. Uh, in regard to data security as an accounting practice, we would hold personal data. This could arrive on paper format or via email. Obviously, this information is held on individuals or company file in the office. Um, the only people who have access is our employees. Do we need to have this information stored under lock and key? And again, <clears throat> that's a decision for the organization themselves. I would say best practice is yes. If there's information, um, personal information on files, they should have them. If they're, if they're hard copy files, they certainly should have them in, under some sort of lock and key to ensure. Um, oh, I fully appreciate it's only the employees there, but it could be unfortunate enough to have your premises broken into. Yeah. Um, I'm sure you have potentially have cleaners on the premises and so forth. Not not saying for one minute they would be doing anything untoward, but just to give yourself the, the safety and um, or the, the ease of mind to yeah. know that. It's about having the appropriate technical and organisational measures in place yeah. to ensure the security, and, and, and that's what's you know yeah. recommended under GDPR, so it would be. And again, if I could just reference a guidance document, so it's the third of the three that I said, we do also have on GDPR and you under the resources tab, we have a guidance document called Personal Data Security Guidance. And it's actually very, it, it covers quite a lot of what we've spoken about this morning. It talks about you knowing your data. It talks about determining the appropriate level of ICT security that you need for different things. And um, it talks about data collection and retention policies. Um, then also talks about utilizing data process. But again, it's a good document. It gets you thinking. If nothing mm -hmm. else, it gets you thinking about your data and you know what do I need to do? There is some data that I'm sure you have. You might have policies in your organization that don't necessarily need to be under lock and key, but if it's stuff that hold that you have that holds personal data on individuals, certainly you need yeah. to have, have it secure. That was a question we got at the very beginning, <clears throat> actually, um, when we kind of started doing the webinars on GDPR. Um, somebody asked the question that she takes phone numbers. So I think it was a, like a car dealership and she was taking names and phone numbers for uh, one of the, the sales guys to call back. And her question was, well, if I write that in a notepad, I close the notebook at the end of the day, is that you know secure enough option? But again, it's down to, that's a really useful point actually on the website that you have that resource there that they can kind of see and determine themselves what is and isn't yeah. appropriate. Okay. Um, is it mandatory to get a creditor to fill out a form in order to enter their details on our accounts system to pay them? It wouldn't be mandatory, no, but if they want to get paid. It's the process, it's your lawful process for processing the data if they want to be paid. I'm sure you probably, you'd probably have a contract in place. Exactly, yeah. They're, they're, so. Terms or their letter of engagement or whatever it might be would have to have something like that in it. Okay. Uh, my husband asked uh, his employer for a copy of his file containing his personal details. After six weeks, they told him he could look at his file, but to get a copy, they would charge a fiver fee, and he would have to make a list of the pages he wants. They won't just copy the whole file for him. Sure, this surely isn't acceptable under the GDPR. No, if he's requesting, if he's looking for all of the details that they, they hold on him, um, he's entitled to that unless the organization are giving a justifiable reason for why there is some of this information that is not being disclosed. 
um, obviously you can't see from that and um, the fee has been waived under the GDPR again I don't know when this took place it could have taken place prior to the 25th of May when organizations could could charge and um, but I on the basis of what of the, the, the question and the comment and um, now I don't see why the individual is not getting not getting access to all of his data and they are the type of, of issues that we get complaints about and is it okay for them to charge for that no it's supposed to be it's supposed to be it's supposed to be, uh, free. It's supposed to be free it's supposed to be waived um, I think there is there is, is there a, an exemption, there is an exemption. If, it, if it causes yeah if there's depending on the, yeah, if it's a, if it's a massive massive amount of of resource that has to go in and again not knowing and um, not knowing the internet so this one yeah. but it and um, there there can be a small nominal nominal fee applied but again going back to why they are only willing to release some of the data and not at all um, they should certainly be informing the individual as to why that's the case and if the individual is not satisfied they can come to ourselves. For me, even looking at that from a HR point of view, it just highlights the need if you're in HR or if you're looking after employee files, don't be holding on to information that you don't yeah. need. Mm -hmm. Just keep it to the minimum because then when you do get those requests, you're, you're you know, where do you start? If, if there's a document that's 10 years old, do you really need it? So I'd be looking to pair back my employee files. And in a way, like we talk about the GDPR, um, really enhancing data subject rights but when you actually think of it from an employee, employer's perspective as well it actually helps you because the GDPR itself sets out that you should only hold what information is required to be held so in itself by by including that and having that as something that you must do it is also helping because as Laura says if you get the likes of these access requests and um, the less information you hold on people the less cumbersome it is for you to actually be able to adhere to the request <laughs> Okay, um, if a potential client contacts us by email requesting a quote, the personal data contained in the email is stored in our system even though they don't become clients. Do you still need to request consent to keep their data? First thing I want to say here, it, GDPR isn't meant to stop people doing business and it's still really important that we, we can work and do our business. Um, some companies have retention policies on emails. I've heard mm -hmm. that, you know, where all emails are deleted after a period. I, I think there's a bit of crossover here in this question between consent, the idea of consent, and in you know, like if you are if, if you're a customer of an individual, you don't need to give consent in order to get paid. Mm. And you know, like if I'm sending an invoice to somebody, there's no actual consent issue there. I I receive invoices regularly in, in my office and there's no um, there's no consent issue. In relation to that, so you know, if somebody is providing a service to us, there's a contract in place. In order for them to get paid, they need to send me the invoice, and I, I arrange for the invoice to be, to be paid. So I'm not quite sure. I think there might just be a little bit of confusion there in relation yeah. to a bit of um, money and kind of consent with 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 um, just the payment. Invoice. And if if somebody let's say emails a, an organisation looking for a quote, and then they they don't use that organisation, but that organisation then includes them on their mailing list for that's selling. Issue. Well, then you've got an issue got an with issue. consent yeah. because they need to have that explicit exactly. consent to continue exactly. to contact them. Exactly. Yeah. Um, kind of another uh, email here or question here about invoices. We sometimes send the customer a copy of the invoice by email. Does it have to be encrypted? If so, does the person also have to have access to the encryption? Again, not wanting to pass the book, <laughs> but it will depend. It's a call you need to make yourself. It depends on what information is on the invoice. You know, the vast majority of invoices, and maybe from a HR perspective, I don't know you guys will, will, will correct me if I'm wrong, but the vast majority of invoices I would be involved in, there'd be no need for encryption because it's just an invoice to for the uh, product or service that's been provided. Um, so it depends on what, I would say it depends on what personal that's data true. there is in in relation to or on, in relation to any invoice. It's a call that you need to make yourself. You need to look and, and make a common sense call yeah, on it as yeah. well. You know, there's no need to be encrypting stuff unless there, there's, there's, there's a potential risk that you see. Okay. Um, is it a data breach if an e email is sent to a group of people normally instead of being sent to a BCC for a blank carbon copy? Okay, I'm going to give you the political answer here, which is <laughs> it depends. So it depends on what the email actually is contains. Yeah. So um, you could be sending around something about leave. You could be, you know, this is your new annual leave policy. This is something about your social club, and you you send it to. 
and you need to send it to everybody BCC, but you send it to everybody in the in the to the send box. Mm -hmm. You need to make a call then yourself as the organization now that you've disclosed people's email addresses to one another. And if they're internal, if it's internal um, staff, I don't think there's an issue there. Um, but you need to make that call yourself. I think where there's more of an issue is where you may have, a, um, give an example of, of something pretty recent whereby, again, erroneously, they, an organization instead of BCCing to a, to a number of people, they put, put it into, sent it to everybody, and it had a lot of personal details um, contained within the email. Um, but again, I go back to, Go back to the principles that I set out earlier in relation to a breach notification. You need to work out yourself. Do you reckon there's a risk? There's a, there's a risk to an individual um, posed by erroneously sending it in the in the manner which it was done, um, and that call is on is on the organisation themselves. Okay. Can you please expand on what the privacy policy should look like for employees? So acting as a payroll or HR, uh, are we expected to give each individual employee a privacy policy? Well, I think you're expected, whether you call it a, a privacy policy or not, you're expected to provide the data subjects, the employees, with details um, about how you process their information, how you store it, who it is shared with. So certainly, again, it depends on what way you call it, how you call it, you have to provide them with that information. As Jenny has said earlier, Bright Contracts provides, um, I, I use the word template loosely because, we, you know, it's very, it's very dependent on your own organization and decisions you've made, but it, it provides you with a tool to create your employee privacy policy. It means you don't have to go and reissue contracts of employment or, you know, change the kind of... Well, I generally contract. wouldn't be putting this in your contract no. of employment and always putting your employee privacy policy in as a sample separate. or as a separate. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, we have a large number of employees and do we really have to print the pay slips and find the employee and hand deliver it to them? They don't have any email addresses. Not sure, if that's a GDPR question or <laughs> a payroll question. They need it uh, under payroll law, or they need it. They, Jenny, you know this one. Yeah. They need a pay slip. So, however, you provide it with them. Exactly. Yeah, you're legally obliged to provide them with a statement of their earnings at the end of each pay period. So, um, if they don't have emails, um, then yeah, your your hard copy is is the only option. But obviously, emails would be a lot more secure. Or possibly yourself, so, well, yeah, 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 portal, yeah, self service yeah. portal, yeah. But I'm thinking if they don't have emails, yeah, they don't. They don't. <laughs> <laughs> um, or employees provided their email passwords, which may be their actual email password. Is this something I could check with the employees? Sorry, sorry. Um, I'm guessing the payslip or the passwords for the payslips is the same password as the email login password to the portal. To the connect? Um, I think this was asked earlier when I'm not sure. Okay. Yeah, we might move on. Yeah. Sorry, <laughs> sure uh, we have this is kind of one for Jenny really. Um, I've tried to send a list of employees but not got no response from revenue uh, that the file was received. Uh, did we do something wrong? So this is in relation to PUI modernization. PMOD. It's called PMOD now, apparently. <laughs> Um, so yeah, it's probably best if you want to contact our support team and uh, you can either call them by phone or email and they'll get back to you. Okay, um, if I'm using the Bright Contracts Bureau for my clients, am I the processor? So to clarify, I need my clients to do up a contract. Yes, you are the processor um, and yes, you should have a contract in place or a, um, and a DPA or some details of the processing. Again, you could use the template that we have on on, um, the, on the thesaurus website and, and adjust it in relation to the, the, the Bright Contracts relationship. Okay. I use Bright Pay on behalf of my employer. Will there be an additional charge to link up with Bright Pay Connect? Um, so yeah, Bright Pay Connect costs an, an additional 59 euro per employer per year. Uh, so if you are a payroll bureau offering a uh, connect to a number of clients, we do also have bulk discounts for that. So that's an additional price on top of the payroll software. Um, what period of time is legal to hold data belonging to a previous employee? Again, that goes, it depends. Um, it's part of your data retention policy um, and you need to, and we've mentioned a few times now, you need to have a justifiable reason for why you're doing so. Depending on what area, what line of work you're in, there may be reasons why. I'm not sure what you were saying within 
in your own is it six years? Sure. When we talk about payroll, payroll records, we really use six years. Different different employment records will have their own legal guidance, mm -hmm. guidance, and so you'll primarily be kind of guided by the legal yeah. rules there the as statutory well. Statutory obligations. Statutory obligations yeah. to hold information, and then you again for other information that you might hold on employees, reviews or disciplinary records, again, you may decide, you'll have to decide yourself as to what, how yeah. long you want to hold them for and there, have a justifiable reason. There is no one size that fits all on these kind of questions. And to be perfectly honest, it's probably, it's one of the areas where I think for organisations, although sometimes you feel it's a real hassle, but it's where the GDPR has become really, really beneficial because it's actually getting organisations thinking about these yeah. questions now. And you can, you know, if you haven't thought about it before now, you can actually put a bit of thought in, you can have it written down, you can have your policy, you can be transparent with everybody so everybody knows exactly what you do and how you do it. So it's, it's, an, it's actually a very, very important question. The answer to say is there's no one size fits all. You're going to have to go off and do your own bit of research and try and work out what, what the right answer is for you, but at least then going forward, you know and your employees know. I'm going off a little bit, but just kind of it's coming. To it, and we were talking about earlier about GDPR not being a you know a tick box and you're done, and it's ongoing. And we've and I found it in here as well. And I'm glad that we took the time internally to get prepared, and we spent a bit of time, got documents in place, because as we're you know as we have prospective new customers coming on and people are more educated at GDPR, we're finding it's now becoming a default question of our prospective mm. customers, you know, when they're asking what the price is, whatever, and what's what's our support, what are your GDPR compliance measures, um, and now we, we, at least we have a tool that we can give our support people to hear the answers and it's there and it's prepared and we're ready for that question. So I think maybe it will take a bit of time to get yourself sorted on how you process data, but it's worthwhile because it's ongoing and people, if you're wanting new customers, you're bringing them people on board, they're going to ask the question. Sorry, that was my, my <laughs> rant, sorry. Okay, um, kind of a follow-up to that one that came in there. Uh, does statutory obligation override the client's request for a Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. Uh, we have emergency contact details for each of our employees. Is it okay for each manager to hold their employees' emergency numbers? as HR might not always be available. I, I think that's very good. That's your justifiable reason, so you've noticed. Yeah. Health fine. and safety. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing else, yeah. Okay. Um, we are an accountancy firm, and each year we sent a leaflet outlining the main points of the budget to our clients. Do we now need to get their consent to send these? Well, I suppose your starting point is you may already have their consent, mm -hmm. so you need to look. You know, you don't necessarily have to go out and, and read consent, so if, if, if clients have already signed up, to you sending them a newsletter in the past or a leaflet or whatever it is that you send out but if you've already got that consent you're fine to continue but you just may need to make sure that the consent that you have been given and again the guys have gone over it after i did it's you know that it's unambiguous and that it's informed that people know what they are what they have signed up for and they have given they have affirmatively given their consent to you so that's it you know you have to look back and see how how you have initially got the details um, but you know, quite a lot of the co companies that I've worked with um, over the last number of months, they've already got consent because it's it's something that they had in the past. Okay. Um, can I include my data security terms in the SLA? As a lot of my clients would not be aware of contracts and etc. around GDPR, I'm thinking of a way to help them and at the same time covering things on my end. So can you include your data security terms in the service level agreement? Certainly, but I think privacy needs to be have its own section. It needs to be clear, am I right? Mm, that? Yeah. So it needs to, at least if it's within the SLA, in some way be defined or highlighted mm. that this is the the GDPR section mm. of it, if you like, or the data protection section of it. It's great to hear this question. From our, from our perspective, it's great to hear this type of question. And, this kind of attitude towards this issue being taken because it's showing straight away there's transparency and accountability yeah. working that here's an individual who wants to be more transparent and it's just finding the right way to do it but by all means yes the, the more information that you can provide as far as uh, we would be concerned the better um, and it's just finding the right the right methods to, to do that yes yeah this is what we've kind of said before for our payroll bureaus a lot of your customers are a small employer and they may not be up to date or familiar with yeah, it and yeah. if you can take that role as educator i think it's great definitely yeah just remember to try and keep it simple you that know, they understand that they understand yeah. try and make you know, it as simple as possible yeah. okay 
If my company collects contact details of individuals uh, we deal with, such as employers or customers, is that considered to be personal data? After all, an individual can be identified from their email address and company names. Yeah. 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 Okay. Our pension returns are sent by email. Should this be um, encrypted? This area of encryption for me, like the, the GDPR doesn't state anywhere that it must be encrypted. It's all security measures that you think are are reasonable or and, and you know appropriate. Can, and appropriate. Mm. So it's again, it's it's a, an internal call. I would say. Again, if you want to go back to for organisations, um, and I'm not plugging our website by the way. <laughs> I don't get anything extra for getting extra hits on it. But the personal data security guidance is actually, there's very good areas, as I said earlier on, there's the piece about determining the appropriate level of ICT security, um, and it might be a good guide for people to, to try and set, find out what they think themselves they, they should be doing. Okay. Um, if you send an invoice by email to the wrong email address, is this a data breach? The information would be name, address, and contact details, as well as the details of the service undertaken. Potentially, but again, I go back to what I said earlier: the risk you need to you need to establish yourself um, as the organisation whether you consider that there's a risk to the individual. There may be a competitive risk, for example, because it may be a financial issue here because all of a sudden you're disclosing potentially to another it could be a competitor. You're disclosing how much somebody else charges for for X or Z. But again. Potentially, it could be a breach, and it's a, it's a, but it's a matter that that the organisation would need to consider, in, in the, and it's it would be on a case by case basis. Again, there's no, unfortunately, there's no one one size fits all, and for these. Okay, um, I prepare accounts for various clients, and these clients get their suppliers to send me their invoices directly. What do I need to have in place for this? Okay, so the supplier contacts. The bookkeeper, the accountant, with the invoice as opposed to the customer directly. It's the same thing, I, I would imagine. It's, processing it's, data. You're still yeah. processing yeah. the data, so you would still have to have, you know, some form of security in place and um, an agreement, obviously, with your your own customer that um, that is part of the agreement. Not really sure I understand Sorry, that one correctly. Can you just read, read, read that one out again, yeah. please? So, um, I prepare accounts for various clients, and these clients get their suppliers to send me their invoices directly. What do I need to have in place for this? I'm, trying, I'm actually trying to think of a practical example of how this works. So, yeah, it is. It's, it's just back to it. It's, it's it's the same issue. It's just the security. You just need to to assess yourself what level of security you want to put in place for for it. Um, Try to work out how yeah. it actually work. Um, <laughs> it's about everybody's circumstances are going to but be different. I wonder is the situation here is the, the, the data controller is your client and you're the data processor. Yes, right. Should you only be taking instruction from the controller rather than getting involved with the data subject? Is this is, I suppose to me here mm -hmm. it would be firstly I want to clearly define who is who in the mm -hmm. relationship yeah. because I know if, if I think about it from an employee perspective. Ideally, I wouldn't want employees contacting my payroll bureau because the payroll bureau should be taking guidance from, from the controller, you, just, uh, controller who, and that's yeah. where the relationship lies, and that goes back to the importance of your contract. I suppose maybe maybe it depends on what you have in place in your contract. In your contract, yeah, yeah. And maybe yeah. you want to have a specific clause that that allows that. Yeah. Okay. Um, I work in a regulated industry and subject to audits from third parties who claim to have unrestricted access throughout our organisation. Is this correct? Sorry, I have, to, I have to read that one again and get my head around. <laughs> I work in a regulated industry and subject to audits from third parties who claim to have unrestricted access throughout our organisation. Is this correct? I think it's very hard to answer that without yeah. knowing your business. Yeah, yeah. Quite, quite possibly. I know like, the likes of the CNAG controller and auditor general can go into you know, government departments and agencies and, and audits, audits elements. Again, it is a difficult one to know without knowing the ins and outs of it. Um, that was actually a question that came up quite recently. Um, so a, a bureau, a payroll bureau who was processing the payroll for a client and the client had a WRC inspection, the payroll bureau was questioning whether or not he was allowed, because he had all the payroll information, whether or not he was allowed to give the information to the WRC. 
but that's a state body. It's and you think of course they they, they, they would have yeah. overriding legal yeah. legal obligations yeah. over that. So hmm. and imagine it's something similar, but we'd have to know. But and if they're regu- if it's they say a regulated body, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, I'd imagine it's probably probably along those lines along or those CNAG lines, or. So, yeah. Okay, saving data on platforms such as OneDrive or Google Drive or Dropbox, is this GDPR compliant? Um, without getting into the specifics of any individual, like we, we look at, we look at the, I suppose, the accountability and transparency of all of those um, multinational organisations. If I can't. I, I can't comment on any individual one, mm. um, and I don't know. Obviously, don't know the circumstance of it. But these multinationals, obviously, you know, they've put a huge amount of work into the GDPR compliance and getting themselves ready. Um, and I suppose only over time we're going to tell, be able to tell whether they are compliant, fully compliant with GDPR. Um, but at the moment, we, I can say, I'm, I'm not aware of us having a huge amount of complaints against some of them. Mm. Um, but there are some. We have received complaints against uh, one or two of those that have already been in the media since the 25th of May. Can I just put my chuckle's worth in? And you might disagree, so mm-hmm. we don't, don't like to know your feedback. Mm-hmm. My kind of thought on this is so far as if you're using one of these large providers, and I'll say Google Drive for the minute, mm-hmm. they're essentially processing your data. So mm-hmm. they're your data processor. Now, it's if my payroll bureau is the accountant next door, it's easy for me to go to, to, to them with a DPA and ask them to sign it. It's more unrealistic that Google are going to sign a DPA for you. So in that regard, then, in order to show as a data controller, as an employer, to show that I've taken all steps reasonable and I've been, I'm trying my best under GDPR, if you're able to show that you went online and mm-hmm. downloaded Google's privacy policy and you've taken steps to the best of your ability to confirm that they're secure. So that's all you can Absolutely. you can show that should you have an inspection or should something Absolutely. happen. Absolutely. Absolutely. protect yourself as best yeah. you can. Yeah. And if you do have any concerns that you highlight the concerns yourself in some shape or form. Uh, but absolutely, you know, you go and, and you do as much as you can possibly do. Yeah, that's um, reasonable. Yeah, definitely. And chances are these these large, these large bodies are going to have their details in their own privacy policies. Yes. They do. I, yeah. I've done it for ourselves, and, and the information as time went on, you could get more and more, more, more information. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, uh, we have Sora software, and we use Connect with regard to holidays. Is it possible that annual leave can be authorised by a number of supervisors? Do supervisors have access to the pay of employees then? Uh, so like I mentioned earlier with the users, you can limit them so that they don't have um, access to the payroll information. But as well as that, you can set up users by department. So you might have one um, manager approving the annual leave of marketing and another um, manager approving the annual leave of sales, for example. So um, you can set up the different users depending on where they need to be. Um, if I have a query uh, regarding a pension with a former employer going back 10 to 15 years, is it reasonable to expect them to retain the detailed records? You're going to be guided here by regulation, and pension is one of those that, that is longer because your pension, you, you need records of pension until someone retires or beyond. So I would be thinking I would hold my pension records on. If somebody is a, a member of your scheme or a deferred member of your pension scheme, once they're in your pension scheme, regardless of the, whether they're still an employee or not. Yeah, because they're a deferred member. So a mm. deferred member means they are a member, but they, they've gone they've off. They've gone off, yeah. You should have made that information. Yeah. Okay. And the last question then. Um, I've used our business Facebook page to advertise to employees. How does this legislation affect me? Sorry, to advertise for, for employees. employees. So like a recruitment drive on Facebook. I assume so, yes. Yeah. Absolutely fine. Because yeah. there's no personal data involved. So. It depends on what you do with the personal data that you then get mm. of the, the prospective employees. Um, One thing on that, when you are recruiting as part of your privacy policy, because when you're recruiting, you're obviously getting empl- data, whether they become an employee or not. So in your privacy policy, that's for your customers, or it's on the w- end of your website. Maybe you should include a section there to say what you deal with, how you deal with mm-hmm. CVs, mm-hmm. and how long you hold them. That mm-hmm. might be the place where they go, where that information goes. But I take it that this is probably just as you know, publicjobs.ie, for example, would have stuff and it goes out onto different, you know. I would often 
share stuff myself yeah. through Facebook. I, I, I'm assuming that's what, what the, the individual here in question talked about, but they're not actually taking applications via Facebook um, or any of the platforms. It's just advertising the fact that you are doing a recruitment campaign. And there's no personal data. And there's no personal data yeah. there. It's just an information. Okay. Uh, final question again. Sorry, another one from in there. <laughs> Um, in processing employee payroll, I received their medical certs. Is this a breach of GDPR as the only information I need is their start and end dates of leave, not the reason for leave? No, the medical certs is a requirement um, for the employer to hold, um, you know, especially if they have like a, a sick pay policy in place and um, if they're topping up their pay or not. So generally you'll find if there's a sick pay policy in place, a medical cert is required after a certain period of time. So. I, I might ask you, because it says here in processing employee, employee payroll, mm. if I'm the bureau, I don't know if I need that, but if I'm the oh, employer. Oh yeah, if you're the employer. I would possibly need it, so it will depend on. But again, yeah, but I take it if you're the processor and you don't need, there may be something in your contract that you have that says that this is specifically what my role is, is to do with the payroll element, if there's anything to do with sick leave, it's nothing to do with the yeah, processor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Back. It goes back to the... Or whoever it is. Okay, um, so that's it for all the questions. Um, thanks to everyone for joining us for today's webinar. Um, and we will send the follow up in the email again with. Um, sorry, are you trying to? No, I'm just putting up some um, for our, our upcoming webinars. Oh, yes. <laughs> our PMOD webinars. PAY modernization is known as PMOD. <laughs> The modernization was quite the mouthful. Yeah, it was. It was really. Okay, so you'll see um, on the screen here are our next few webinars. Uh, they're scheduled for November and they both look at the upcoming PMOD uh, changes, uh, which take effect for employers this January. So both webinars are CPG accredited, free for everyone to attend, and they will feature a guest speaker from the Revenue Commissioners. So that's it for today. Perfect, yes. Thank you very much, everybody. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you found it informative. Thank you so much to Graham for coming out and joining with us. Um, we found it useful. <laughs> we're, we're going to pull the ear off. There. <laughs> <laughs> um, perfect. So, and just a quick reminder, you'll get the questionnaire when you log out, and we love hearing your feedback, so please do. Um, it would be great if you could fill it in. Um, and thank you very much, and we'll talk to you all soon. Great. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.